So I want to thank everybody for coming tonight. This for us is, um, man, it's just a real mission for us. And we're so passionate and grateful tonight to have both of these congressmen take time out of their night. It's eight o'clock back on the East Coast. So very grateful that they're taking time before their vacation to come spend the evening with us and talk a little bit about ALS and the two pieces of legislation that are going on both in the House and the Senate right now. So we all know that this history of ALS, it started you know, 150 years for the people that aren't familiar with the disease. We haven't had any treatments. And there's a small population of patients. Dr. Kutkovitz a couple weeks ago talked about the problems that are encountered with getting a big population of patients. And that's why there's been such a delay in getting some of the treatments and therapies. And so we're really, really grateful to the team over at IMALS as well as to the team with Eric and Amanda Stevens, with Team Stevens that have led this charge and worked with Congressman Fortenberry and Congressman Quigley to help get this legislation passed. They're gonna talk about a few things tonight and I just wanna give a brief background on both of them in case you don't know them. So Congressman Fortenberry, if you don't know, is a Republican from Nebraska. He's been representing the first congressional district since 2005, born in Baton Rouge, down in the Bayou. And he went on to get his master's both in theology and in public policy. He's married, he's a dad with five children, and among his committee appointments, he's on the appropriations committee that, that oversees the FDA. And importantly, he is one of the original members of the ALS caucus and of course a co-sponsor of HR 7071, which we're so excited about getting passed. But I also want you guys to know, in case you don't know his background, that he also has a personal connection to ALS. His wife's little brother passed away just last year in 2019. And so for him, this is also a real personal mission. And then we have Congressman Quigley, who is gonna be joining us from the fifth, he represents the fifth congressional district in Illinois. He was born in Indiana and grew up in Illinois. He's got his master's in public policy and his law degree from Loyola. He's also married with two kids and he's also one of the original members and the co-sponsors of this bill. And for him, he's also got a background with environmental policy. And so it's so relevant to us here with people that are struggling with sporadic ALS and the lack of research into some of these causes. So I know that's a personal mission. So for both of them, immense gratitude, not only for you appearing with us tonight, but most importantly, for being bipartisan advocates in an era where there's not a lot of bipartisan legislation and a lot of bipartisan commitments for both of you, Congressman Fortenberry and Congressman Kigui, we are immensely, immensely grateful. So I am going to turn it over to the two of you and let you take over tonight. Thank you. Sure. Congressman Quigley and Congressman Fortenberry, it's all yours. Jeff, you're the lead sponsor, go ahead. Thank you, Jeff, oh, you're muted. Hold on, let me unmute you again. Hold on there. Okay, we want to mute you one more time. Unmute in the top right. There you go. All right. There, go. there we are. Uh, the name underneath me says Andrew Brainer. This is my chief of staff's computer, so I'm sorry about that, but I'm Jeff Fortenberry. Thank you for the kind introduction, Michelle. Thank you, Mike Quigley, Congressman Quigley, my friend and colleague, for uh, deferring to me. Look, this has got to be a team effort, so it's not about uh, Democrats and Republicans. It's about trying to transcend uh, all of this suffering to try to find a place of meaning so that we can fight this off. Um, you're kind to give a little bit of uh, background on me, Michelle. I've uh, been in public service a while now, and it, one of the hardest things to do is to obviously see um, someone suffer and then not be empowered to do anything. And ALS is uh, so difficult. I don't have to tell you all that um, as you um, both. Uh, reach for hope, cling to hope, work hard, advocate, and at the same time, suffer. Um, Michelle mentioned my brother-in-law who was 37 when he died, um, died last year. He didn't die last year, he died a few weeks back. Um, I think it was in April, as I recall. And um, my, he's my wife's younger brother and there were seven kids. And my wife is still, um, sad um, in, in many ways and um, because you have a extraordinarily healthy young man with four small children whose hand began to do that three years ago and now he's gone. So I, the only interaction that I had with your world, your world of difficulty, 
um, your world of um, trying to, uh, again, deal aggressively with this severely degenerative disease was that when I was very young, I remember very clearly one of the first books I ever read was on a baseball player named Lou Gehrig. So I find myself here probably 50 years later having had this cast upon my own family and now having the gift, honestly, to be in solidarity and friendship with you all, this community that is looking for creative ways to keep optimism and hope alive while continuing to be strong advocates, telling the story, not going away appropriately, uh, so that the possibility of us having some kind of breakthrough, and we've had 50 some odd failures so far, but the, keeping the possibility of some kind of breakthrough alive. So I think this honestly in my own family suffering and yet in some small way, maybe being a part of your own suffering, um, it brings great meaning to me. Um, you go into public service because ultimately it, it is about finding what is good and noble and true. And when you can stand in solidarity with people in need who have a common vision and maybe just maybe contribute something to it, 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 it is again attaching you to the reasons that you went into the public service to begin with as hard as it is. Um, Michelle, you're right, it is a tough time. Um, there are many divisions in our country. But when it comes to uh, disease research and caring for those in need, Americans tend to unite. Our struggle with ALS, though, is it's a narrow category of disease. Not everyone sees it. Uh, not everyone knows about it. So for Mike and I and others who have joined in this effort to be able to try and lead something in Congress, again, is a, it's really our honor and our privilege to be able to stand with you to do something. We, we think we have a creative pathway um, I did get a call from Dr. Francis Collins two weeks ago. Um, we've appealed to the White House for a very long time on a whole variety of issues to see what they could do through the executive branch, but uh, they're going to move $25 million basically to start the research over to try to rethink the paradigm. In the meanwhile, Congressman Quigley and I have worked on the this issue of trying to expand the uh, access through the uh, National Institute of Health and create a center of excellence at the Food and Drug Administration uh, to accelerate drug approval. So that's the core basis of, of this particular bill that we've worked on. Um, Mike and I are again on the Appropriations Committee. We spend your money. Um, a long time ago, I had a choice to get on appropriations or to stay where I was. And I thought, well, we can talk about issues or we can write the check. And I kind of figured out, as Mike did way before me, um, it's kind of better to write the check. And so he and I are part of this uh, important effort here and on a lot of other things because when dollars are spent, that actually is the policy. And so I'm proud to be a part of that. Um, we have worked aggressively with one of the Democrat leaders. Her name is Rosa DeLauro from Connecticut. And I told Rosa what was happening in my own family and some of the initiatives I was going to undertake. Again, having visited with a number of you who have come to my office and, and pleaded, but it pleaded in friendship and again in solidarity with me to figure help help figure out a pathway here. I kept Rosa informed all along the way, and of course, she and I have big political differences and differences of personality and all that. But she was in my face. You have to do something, Jeff. You must do something. She's very you know, strong personality, and um, Mike working with Rosa as well has, uh, we're on the verge, I think, of uh, possibly doing something in this appropriations bill that would, again, move the ball forward in terms of the funding of these new categories of uh, research options that we're trying to, to lay out right now through a, a legislative bill. So I'll stop there. And uh, again, I, I'm grateful for your time, uh, your willingness to continue to, again, be in dialogue with us, um, having, Brian uh, Wallach and, and Dan Tate and others who have been so wonderfully guiding, giving counsel to us, even in the midst of their own suffering, again, is another layer of meaning for me. So I just want to call them out and, and thank them. But um, I'll stop there. But you're, again, you're kind, Michelle, to invite me on tonight. I, I'm, I'm really, really grateful. It was a hard loss for our own family to see the, the youngest one of the brothers and sisters go first leaving four small children behind. But 
he was a beautiful man and, um, and he found meaning in his suffering. And, um, and we, we cling to that. So thank you very much. Thank you for joining us. And I'm gonna turn it over to Congressman Quigley so you can address our team here. Great, thank you. It's, uh, it's an honor to be with you tonight. Let me begin by saying that uh, you're fortunate to have Jeff as a sponsor. He's uh, extraordinarily well respected on both sides of the aisle, uh, a veteran at this, and clearly, as you can see, has the passion and the understanding uh, to move this forward. So as the, the Democratic lead, uh, I, I couldn't have a better partner. Uh, and I wanna also thank you all for your efforts. Uh, your voices really do matter. Uh, your voices for others have an amazing impact. And I want you to know that people are, are listening. Uh, we lost my dad a year ago from a different disease, a neurological disease, Parkinson's. And it's different, but you know, the pain, the pain is the same, and the desire to do something more is, is there as well. Let me echo a little bit about what Jeff was saying, but also talk about putting this into a broader perspective. Our, our country has never done anything well when it thought small. It was always the daring, almost outlandish, uh, ridiculous notions, right? And, and we give them names when we wanna uh, talk about things on a larger scale, right? Uh, the New Deal, uh, the Manhattan Project, uh, the Moonshot, right? Going to the moon in, in this decade or, you know, that's just beyond the realm. But uh, when we dream big and, and, and act bigger, and that's what we do. Uh, we do particularly well and I think we lead we lead the world and mankind. Uh, and when it has a good heart behind it like this does, and I don't think there's anything that uh, we can't do. Um, I share your frustrations, and I think the, the reason Jeff is thinking about this bill is, you know, the old Etch-a-Sketch, you shake it and it's, the screen is gone. To an extent, there's things we can build on, but for the most part, uh, Thinking about this afresh is, is so important, and that's why the Center of Excellence at NIH is so important. And uh, you, know, you can build on existing models, but you, we really have to do so much more. Uh, there are some things that uh, take a will. There's other things that, uh, as appropriators, we know just take dollars. Uh, this needs both, and a lot of them. So uh, I think we're gonna have a lot of help from Rosa DeLauro and our other uh, colleagues on the Republican side. Uh, I know there's a Senate companion. Uh, so we're also talking about a public-private partnership. That's uh, extraordinarily important. And, and whenever you do things differently like this, you're gonna meet some resistance. Um, so we're gonna need you front and center, explaining why that matters. Your voices are, are far more effective and powerful than uh, either Jeff or myself. Uh, so we look forward to moving forward together uh, and providing that critical ingredient to all of you and the ones you love, uh, uh, that great thing called hope. Thank you. Thanks, Congressman Quigley. So um, as you know, we sent out uh, questionnaires to people ahead of time and asked you to submit some questions for both of the congressmen. And as uh, everybody would imagine, one of the most pressing issues is timing. So we heard some really compelling statements from people that joined us, um, people that are fighting for their life right now, and they don't qualify for clinical trials because they are past the two-year stage or because their ALS FRS scores have gotten uh, too severe to qualify for the trials. And it seems to be about 80% of the people that are in that basket of people who have no nothing, nothing to look forward to and to help fight for their lives. So the biggest questions that we got were when, when do you expect that there will be a vote in the committee? Um, when can we expect that this would go to the full House floor? And what kind of support do you have with the existing House ALS caucus? And who do we need to lobby the most? That's kind of the pressing issue for most of the people to start with. Um, Michelle, this is Jeff again. I'm sorry, I've lost the video. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, we absolutely can. Yes. Okay. And you're showing up. 
You're showing oh, I am? Side on the video. Yeah. So don't okay. do anything on Torrid. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I just can't see you all anymore. I don't know what I, what I, I was reading the, uh, some of the people were in the chat room and I was reading it and I, I must have hit something that I don't understand very well and cut you off. Anyway, great questions. Um, Mike Quigley said it best. We, we need you. Um, it is very important that we create, that you help create what we call the preconditions for a good outcome here. So things happen when there's an alignment of three things. The policy, which we have, which we think is sound, the process, which we are working right now, and the politics. Now what I mean by politics is not the dirty word politics. I mean the dynamics, the preconditions, the understanding, the movement, the creative pressure, the imagination, uh, the media, all of the above creates the climate in which makes it possible for Congress to act. Congress doesn't often act in a, in a vacuum. This might be the best idea in the world, but unless you have uh, good members of Congress like Mike Quigley and Rosa DeLauro on your side, that process isn't going to work. Uh, so we are aligning right now two of those three dynamics. This other area, again, creating the conditions in which Congress can potentially consider this really does depend upon our partnership with you. Uh, we'll do what we can, obviously, to tell more and more members about this, uh, to try to create, again, momentum around it. I think we're gonna have some good news coming out of appropriations. Like I said, the administration has already launched a new initiative which has longer term implications in terms of re resetting the research models. But this particular bill combined with funding, I would hope that we could pass it uh, this year. Uh, we do have Senate companions working on it. Uh, we need more House members to get on it. Uh, where it is getting out there, but again, it's not a one-time issue. Please help us to spread this word, whomever your Congress member is, that this is important to you. Uh, since it is bipartisan, since it is a sound idea, since it has been vetted by many, many people, we shouldn't get uh, too hung up on any sort of substantive policy differences, I think, at this point, but it still does need to go through a system. So again, again I think on the House of Representatives side, in terms of um, the dynamics around funding, if we can get the full bill through, we're, we're looking in better shape. That will take place through uh, July. Uh, whether or not we complete that process in the Senate with the Senate in September is an unknown. For the last several years, we have not been able to do that. It, it goes all the way to the end of the year, the beginning of next year. But I would feel confident that we can probably hold on to this money. The, the legislative lift around, again, the structure of the new law, the new program, is going to take us longer. Um, but it, I'm hopeful that it could run in a parallel fashion. So help us, please. Um, I know that might sound a little bit strange because I, th I think a lot of people think if we just tell our Congress member to do something, then, then it'll happen. It, it, does, it just doesn't work like that. We have, to, we have to be tenacious. We have to stay with it. We have to have a vision. We have to work to overcome obstacles almost constantly. Uh, that's my commitment to you. Uh, Mike and I have already had very good dialogue about this, again, as I have with Rosa. We just have to accelerate it and expand it quickly. Let me say this, uh, and adding on to that, um, lobby everyone. Uh, this is fresh, this is new, this is a new approach. Um, get people to join the caucus. They're, if they're part of the caucus, they're much more likely to be educated, informed, and, and uh, attempt to help us with other members. But in the meantime, if you haven't talked to your member, talk to them now. Talk. Everybody has two senators, uh, one member, so uh, go to it. Uh, the more the merrier. Uh, I think uh, education needed from patients for folks really on what expanded access really does mean to you. Uh, the opposite of power is not sweetness and light. It's frustration and the lack of something happening. Uh, you have power, you have influence, uh, but it's not a spectator sport. So I encourage you to engage. And before anyone thinks, well, it's such a long trudge, 
we've had some victories here. Uh, this year's FY20, uh, we added uh, $10 million at DOD for ALS research, uh, $25 million at NIH, uh, $20 million NIH ALS research spending since 2018. Uh, legislation like this uh, authorizes uh, a new way of doing things and the ability to spend money. So there's authorizers and there's appropriators. Uh, the, the line in DC is that authorizers think they're God and appropriators know they're God. Um, at this point, you need us both. Uh, this bill authorizes at the same time, uh, Jeff and I are gonna be appropriating. So we've had some success. There is some wind in the sails to, uh, to provide the necessary resources to move forward on this. So that on the appropriation side, on the authorization side, it's another way of looking at it and moving forward uh, and a bold new move. And I applaud uh, Jeff for his efforts. So uh, you need both. Uh, don't in any way be discouraged, uh, you know, for thinking, oh, it's a, a long trudge to do these things. It's a presidential year. Typically, it's harder to pass legislation. There's less time uh, after a certain point in the year. But... Uh, uh, it's also a time when uh, we've seen some barriers broken down uh, when it comes to the CARES Act, for example, and members working together uh, to get something great done at a very difficult time. That's right. so we are committed um, on the fact that it's a presidential year. We're going to fight as members in the ALS community to get this before a, one of the debate issues, right? Talking about expanded access and open label extension. So briefly, um, I know there's a couple of other bills out there that a few people have asked about. So we'll come back to 7071 in just a brief second. But there's the uh, House bill for the ALS disability to expedite Social Security payments. Um, right now, there's a five-month delay from the time that somebody gets diagnosed and, and, and is, uh, applies for the disability. Because of the delay in diagnosis with patients with ALS, it sometimes takes a year or two years, and then we're adding another five months onto that. So what's the progress on uh, the ALS Disability Act? I think that's 1407, HR 1407. You know where we are with that one? Jeff, do you? I, I don't, I'm sorry, Michelle, I don't know. I don't, I can't give you an update. I'm just not aware of where that is. And, in the and we, ha we have <clears throat> uh, staffers on the call as well. Uh, Allison from my staff's on the call. Uh, if you can unmute her, she might know. If not, we can talk about this. I have to pop off in about five minutes to get on another call. Okay, but, we'll, uh, let, no we'll let Allison address that. Um, I'm looking for her here. <laughs> if um, Allison isn't it's there, we can- An hour later. We can certainly find out fairly quickly, Michelle, and get right. that back to you. Maybe you could send it to the community. We will do that. So we'll do that with both of the bills, with the, with the Justice for Veterans Act, which is 4748 as well. So we'll come okay. back to that. Um, when we talk about expanded access versus open label extension, so the difference for some of you that may not be familiar is open label extensions. If you participate in a trial and you may have gotten the placebo, open label extension is where you're gonna be entitled to use that drug or that therapy as long as the trial has been completed, you're gonna be able to have access to that through the remainder of the therapy. So that's one of the things that we are looking to incorporate in the future, but this is expanded access. So expanded access is gonna give you the right to use the drug what's in phase three trials, right? For some of you that aren't unfamiliar with this. So where do you think our biggest hurdles are? That's what we need to understand. Talk to us about what, the, what is our messaging that we need to get out to our congressmen besides we need this. Well, my own, um, I'll be upfront with you. I think a lot of members of Congress think we fixed all this through the law that we passed called Right to Try. Um, because, you know, if, you're, if, if you've got a drug that isn't fully proven through the normal scientific methodological cha um, channels and it's the severity of condition, that bill was a way in which uh, we thought we had solved this problem of being able to gain access even to a drug that's in early trials or experimental. And yet we obviously ran in, run into a significant problem here, uh, particularly with this latest drug. So uh, that was one of the things that we've worked on aggressively, but um, I, I, I don't know if, the, honestly, I could learn something from you all. Um, I've tried to explain this to people by saying they're the right to try did not fix this particular problem. It's expanded access that would. Um, but I, I need to hone my own language in order to maybe break through 
the members of Congress so that they can understand this quickly. Remember that, that since ALS is a narrower disease category and everybody's not familiar with it, it's important that we develop a set of languages that's just very clear. That's one way I've tried to explain it. I'd, I'd like your counsel and feedback uh, if you think that that's an effective me methodology to educate people quickly as to the um, as to the source of the problem here. And, and let me say this, uh, and I'm going to have to pop off and get on to the next call. Um, I think the first step is to is to educate members who have not been informed about this uh, about the broader issues of ALS. Uh, get them. Uh, get them engaged, get them to join the caucus, give them the fundamentals. Uh, in DC, they sometimes talk about it as the elevator spiel. Uh, you often get as much time as you have as an elevator ride. If you could just get that to all members first, and then we start building from that, that's great. The more time you get with them, the best. And I, I, and I do wanna say uh, on 1407, uh, that bill has 264 bipartisan co-sponsors in the House alone. So uh, obviously it's been around for a while, much closer to the finish line. Uh, so we can expect that that could move fairly soon. Um, so, uh, and, and Allison will be available as well to answer questions. Uh, I just wish you all Godspeed and uh, I look forward to our partnership with our good friend, Jeff as we all move forward together. Thank you all. We're very honored you joined us. Thank you so much. The honor was mine. Thank you all. Thank you, Mike. Bye. Michelle, did that um, a question that I put back to you make sense? Yeah, so I think that's probably a lot of people in the ALS community assumed that Right to Try was gonna solve the problem. Right. For them. And I think a couple of the hurdles are the manufacturers, when we talk to the smaller manufacturers, especially, you know, they're not the big pharma companies that have billions of dollars of revenue. Right. And so these small, innovative companies are the ones that don't have the resources to, to put money into it. And the other part of the issue is, is the sample size and the studies, right? And I can explore those some more with, with Ren uh, as well, you know, your chief of staff as well as, as Allison. But when we have pushback, there's no money for anybody to participate. And candidly, the other issue is when we have people from rural communities, they don't have the money to get to an ALS center of excellence, let alone to pay $20,000, $50,000, $100,000 to participate in these trials. So part of the money, part of the issue is the appropriations of the funds so that the manufacturers, these small innovative guys that are fighting for people with ALS, that these manufacturers have the funds to create open label extensions for them and to create expanded access for them. And I don't think that's happening right now. That might be one of the big issues. So the, yeah. so, so the guys right. with the checkbook might help. <laughs> right, right. No, uh, we're, we're well aware of that. And that was part of the last difficulty with the last drug. And um, I actually see the Stevens on the line here as well. Hi, you guys. They've been to my office. Hope you're doing well. We had good dialogue with them and the family. Um, but look, all of this is to say is, I, again, I'm new to the community. I'm here to listen. I'm here to learn. I think what we've created is is a good pathway. Uh, you're raising obviously very relevant issues that are going to also have to be addressed and addressed clearly. Again, we're we've got some momentum here. And when I first went into this, it just it, there, there just wasn't any. And so I think that's that's good progress. So I think the best thing to do is let's focus on this particular bill. Mike and I will focus on guiding the appropriations process. I feel pretty good about that. That flow of money, honestly, I can't absolutely guarantee it. There's a lot of other egos around here, but I feel pretty good about it. I think we've got a good case to make. Again, bipartisan, you guys are doing a great job of informing people that this is your priority. And uh, if we can, in a parallel sense, as Mike said, both establish funding mechanisms along with the legislation, which are two separate tracks, we can do that this year. I think that is just huge, huge progress and it, it, and it, and it moves um, ALS, as Mike was saying, into the forefront of the, the possibilities of science rather than just the ongoing failure of science over the last 50 times we've tried something. And I think this is the, uh, the good thing. Um, it's a little bit of something to cling, cling to in the moment, but again, we're here. 
We're here to learn. Uh, we're here to uh, think constructively and creatively with you about as those hurdles arise. I mean, we're going to need your consult and help uh, to think through this in creative legislative ways. But I do think we have a strong basis and again, good momentum uh, to establish some real markers of progress this year. Okay, so as we look at the at the end, and I know this was like a lot of pals had questions about this, as we get to December and this legislation is not passed, then realistically, we're looking at the 117th Congress, correct? Well, let, let's don't go there. Let's try to get it done this year, okay? Okay, well, that's what I wanna make sure everybody understands the import of that, which no, is I, I, gotta get look, this. Look, I, you know Ren Archer, he is really getting tired of me saying, where are we on ALS? Where are we on ALS? We've got, we've got a couple other things too, but that one's right at the top. Right. Uh, because again, I've, I've heard your cries. I've cried with you, all gone, you know? So we'll, we'll keep, we're gonna do everything we can. I'm just one simple country congressman though from Nebraska. I've got to have the community's help, but you got a great, we've got a great partnership with Mike Quigley um, and, and others who are coming to the forefront. And again, a parallel process. I don't wanna to get too much into all these dynamics of how it works up here, because it really is complicated. But we have a parallel process in the Senate that I think is coming together fairly well. The other thing, if we can align all of the various ALS advocacy groups and, and have a singular muscular focus on this, maybe we can narrow that window, Michelle, and everybody can have a little bit of celebration earlier than the next Congress. I mean, this, this is the moment. We'd love that. We'd absolutely love that. That would that would make everybody's everybody's day and everybody's year. Um, I know that you had some time limits as well, and I want to be respectful of that. If you can stay, yeah. great. But if not, we'll we'll let you get on to whatever else you had. Uh, so it's up to you, Congressman Fortenberry. Well, I, I can I. We're all friends here, right, Michelle? We are. We're going to be can best I, friends. <laughs> can I correct something that you said earlier? Absolutely. So you, you were talking about how Congress has finished for our vacation. Oh. <laughs> we don't really take vacations. <laughs> well, then we'll keep contacting people the next two we, weeks. So we don't call it, We call it district work periods is what we call it. <laughs> well, and actually, so and that's actually. A good Let me ask you this. Yeah. So I, Amanda and Eric and I talked, and they're going to join us in the second half of this call to talk about Thank some you. of their efforts. Can you explain to people the difference from a congressman's perspective of just getting a petition that a hundred or a thousand people have signed versus what it means to have somebody with ALS walk into your office and meet with your legislative assistants or with you? How much of a difference does that make in an impact? Uh, it, it, extraordinarily so. I think that uh, when people can see someone from their own community who has been respectfully making an appointment, who comes in, who spends the time to explain both to staff and if you can with the, with the member, it is a turnaround. Um, we look, this is, I'm gonna show you something. This is on my desk. This is, this is what I call daily context. I, I read all my mail, okay? I, I review every piece of it. And it's a heck of a lot of work. And some, you know, sometimes you get nice notes from people who love you and you get a lot of nice other kinds of notes who people don't. But I think it's important to, to do that. Uh, I can't guarantee that everybody does that, though, in Congress. And so when somebody has an issue, they're thoughtfully and respectfully approaching the office for time. And even if it takes more than one request, I highly, highly recommend that you try to see your member of Congress, either back home or in Washington, if possible. It makes a difference. I hope the Stevens felt like all of their effort, and they're new to this too, has been fruitful. Uh, it certainly was fruitful for me trying to understand the, the, the variations of this disease and how the latest treatment sets are working for various people and didn't work, and the problems encountered in some people getting it, some people not. Extraordinarily helpful to me. And um, so, I, I, I would say if, if, if you can write it, if that's all you can do is write a letter, please write the letter. But if you can make an appointment to see your member of Congress or one of their staff members, preferably the member, it really does make an important difference. But it, again, I would recommend, look, we're, we're all being pulled in a thousand directions and there's a lot of people beating up on us. And so again, as friends, 
if those meetings can be about respect and pleading in a, in a manner that is uplifting to the member, I, I just as again a friend, I can recommend that because it's you have beautiful human stories to tell, and so just tell them. Uh, sometimes advocacy takes the you know the, the character of anger and divisiveness. There's no need for that here. I think just telling everyone the tale of the, the depth of suffering and the longing and the power of the community would be quite moving if it can be done individually. If it can't, uh, yes, a letter is fine, but it's just a big long petition. That, that's probably the least effective. Okay, and we know that both um, IMALS as well as Amanda and Eric's uh, organization, Team Stevens, they have a quick list for you that tells you who your congressmen are, gives you their contact information. So if you have problems accessing them, we have that uh, through both of the organizations. They've made that really easy for you. Um, as we, well, as I the other thing that we we might be able to offer you, Michelle, and I don't know if Ren's on the call, but he's going to go. Oh my gosh, the congressman's given us more work. Remember, we're very small staffs. We do not have limitless resources. I have really three people in the back here that help me on legislation. So, and, and we're in the middle of appropriations and I run agriculture, by the way, and I'm on what's called state and foreign operations. It's a little bit of an aside, but if you encounter some type of unique opportunity where a member is particularly enthusiastic, just come back and tell us and we can possibly contact them and maybe bring them on into a more intimate team so that we can multiply our own effort here so that we can say, hey, can you go talk to these few members and, and help us? So we have something inside of a, the Congress called WIP teams. It's groups of members that actually create a common bond and sort of go out and talk to their colleagues. And that's what we need here. So I see uh, Ren has gotten on the phone. Ren, I know you don't have enough to do, so you want to take that on too? Congressman, I'm so grateful to work on your behalf and on, on behalf of Joe Gregory, who yeah. I came to love as I worked on his behalf over a course of a year and realized all the impediments that patients with ALS face and how tragic it is, whether it's the FDA or NIH or, or structures around trial design, these are all injustices that need to be fixed and that's what you're trying to do. And so, for those that don't know Ren, Ren is also an MD. So yeah. it's great to have somebody who has medical background and understands study design and, and what expanded access and open label extensions are. So he's a really huge asset uh, to join this fight with us. So I'm glad you said that, Michelle, because uh, I, I couldn't do this without Ren. Obviously, we're in a lot of meetings where there's a lot of hard science uh, and terminology. Again, I've, I've got to move from A to Z through a whole variety of issues and skim the top a lot of times. So Ren is the wingman and can go head to head with the scientists at NIH and FDA or even the private sector, it's extraordinarily impressive and really beneficial to me. So I do think we have the responsibility to sort of take on a, a, more of the effort here. We're willing to do that. We just need your help to carry it all. We can't carry it by ourselves, it's too much. Well, we are, we are gonna be working uh, with a huge social media campaign uh, with both the other organizations that are on the calls with us tonight and also a publicity campaign after this. So you're going to hear a whole lot uh, about this. And so we'll be working with the communications teams with your offices too. Uh, Can so. I ask one question before I go? This is your call. <laughs> oh, thanks. Is there anybody from Nebraska on the call? I don't know how you'd identify yourself. I'm sorry. And if, if you, don't, you can raise your hand. And if you don't want to identify yourself, don't, it's not a, it's not a problem. I'm just curious. Anybody? You can type in the chat box or you can, you can raise your hand at the bottom. There's a little scan that you can lift up. There must be some Cornhuskers on here. <laughs> uh, and Michelle, this is Allison with Congressman Quigley's office. Thanks so much for having us. Uh, I wanted to, of course, echo all the sentiments, both Bren and Congressman Fortenberry and Quigley. And Congressman Fortenberry, I know we had the opportunity to speak earlier in the week. It's always humbling to be introduced in, as Bren's peer. Uh, for the reasons that you uh, listed. So thanks for uh, providing us with, at the staff level, an opportunity to work in such a cohesive and collaborative bipartisan way. I, I wanted to take the opportunity, if it's all right, uh, just to answer some of the questions in more detail so that we can add a little level of substance to yes. the conversation. And additionally, I'm following the chat. So right out of the gate, um, most offices are still operating under COVID 
plans and, and I think especially in this community we have every expectation that people need to certainly take care of their health first and foremost we don't want to put anyone in a immunocompromised situation but there are absolute alternative ways to getting a face-to-face -face meeting until we are back up and running at a hundred percent Ren suggested on the chat and I want to echo that the health LA or a person like myself who's a legislative director they are really steeped in the policy world and they're going to be able to answer those questions and ultimately they are going to be the ones who are going to recommend to their bosses how to move forward and do most of the brunt work to get to that final place. There's layers and levels of engagement on Capitol Hill that happens at the member level, the staff level and beyond. So anything that you can do to uh, do that outreach, I just wanna press uh, as incredibly important. Um, as it relates to some of the questions about the messaging and some of the concerns around the actual bill itself, uh, our offices have worked incredibly tirelessly to create a bill that we see as both disrupting the status quo uh, for this particular disease community that would have far-reaching effects for the entire neurodegenerative community and we did so in a way that prioritizes both the federal dollars certainly with the NIH Center of Excellence that was modeled directly after the NIH Center for Oncology which we are seeing as a very successful model um, and now is starting to bear fruit and also empowering our public, uh, excuse me, our private partners in the small biopharma world. I want to just stress that as you discuss some of the barriers to passage and some of the realities that we're facing on the floor, my main message here is that my boss as a Democrat, and I think that he spoke eloquently to this tonight, is very willing to put himself out there as a bipartisan example to think about things in a new way. We too often, especially in the health policy world, uh, get stuck in silos because we do things a certain way and that's just how we do it, especially as it relates to our engagement with our federal partners, FDA, NIH. You know, these are structures that have not necessarily provided much result for the ALS community as much as we support them holistically. We really want to uh, be part of the conversation and pushing them forward to disrupt the status quo because frankly speaking, this community cannot accept the status quo. The urgency is just too high and the prognosis is too serious and short to be given an opportunity to go through things in, in a typical way. We have to create a novel approach. So the biggest barrier that we face to this bill is truly education, but I wanna drill down on that so that you know when you talk to your uh, members of Congress what to actually say from our perspective. We have powerful chairs and um, members who are well-intentioned, who have the absolute best um, in mind and in their hearts as it relates to dealing with this community, who simply just don't know how these programs, expanded access in particular, actually work in the real world. So a big piece of the talking points that we are happy to help you know, engage with and as you develop have to be around what it means to actually participate in a clinical trial, what it means when you can't participate in a clinical trial, what barriers the community actually faces, both specific to when you essentially are no longer eligible, um, and what that means at the end of the road. So the best story that you can tell is the story of your prognosis and treatment. And it's extremely limited as we understand, and that's the story that we need members to understand. I think that there's a fundamental misunderstanding in certain parts of the of Congress, no matter how well-intentioned uh, members are, simply about how the current structures are not meeting the moment. Uh, we just want to believe that we've created like a perfect government that can do everything exactly as designed. And as, as it relates to this issue in particular, that's just simply not true. So um, I just wanted to share that to offer uh, an opportunity to um, brainstorm, certainly, and to use this call as a jumping off point. Uh, I'll end my comments by saying, obviously, Ren and I were extremely deliberate in the language that we chose. Oh, is that me? I, my apologies. Uh, Ren and I were extremely deliberate. We, we probably took about seven to eight months to craft this bill. We went through rounds and rounds of edits. Uh, we do not want to see it fall on the trash heap. So we're going to work extremely hard to find any path forward for this Congress. But I also, 
and I don't want to correct you, Congressman Fortenberry, that's not something staff typically do, but I don't want people to believe that this is the end of the road for expanded access, our particular bill, if we can't get it done this Congress. We are ultra committed to this fight, and um, if we do not find the path forward, that will not change. Um, so please utilize REN myself as resources. We are steeped in the weeds at this point. And um, it, as, as both of our bosses have said, it's really an honor to fight on your behalf and to be uh, welcomed into this community. So thanks so much for giving me the opportunity to share those thoughts and happy to answer any other questions. Uh, Michelle, thank you, Allison. M M Michelle, this is Jeff Fortenberry again. Um, thank you, Allison, very well stated. Uh, no, you, you appropriately are correcting me by managing expectations. We need to do everything we can to get this done now. I feel like we have some momentum, we have some windows, but again, we've got to align the policy, the process, and to make it simple, the politics, which is again, the preconditions by which things get done. And then we hope that all those things can go through, but it, it just requires an enormous amount of work, you're right. And so I don't wanna create a false expectation. We do have a lot of work to do, but I also want to say, I think we've made progress and I'm, I'm hopeful that we've, we've got a window now that's cracked that we can throw open and fly through. Um, and and that, that's, that's what I want to stay focused on, but uh, Allison has the right perspective. We, we might have to take a longer view on this, but let's, let's uh, hit the governor and push the gas right now. And that's what Mike and I, I, I think that's fair to say, Allison, that that's what Mike and I want to do. Oh, Allison, you're muted. So Michelle, this is Ren. Yes, I think I, I, just just to add a few things here. I mean, obviously, I echo very much what the two congressmen have said, and also Allison has been a tremendous partner. I think that I think the the question about policy is understanding the context of this bill too, and that is that the reason that we wrote this bill this way is because on the center of excellence, which is to try to make FDA more efficient the commissioner of the FDA told us, please do this. This will help me do what's right. When we talk about the Center of, Ex Center of Excellence or the expanded access at the National Institutes of, Institutes of Health, we spent the months of October through the uh, months of May working with NIH through the chairman, chairwoman of the uh, subcommittee on Labor HHS, which is oversees the NIH, and pushed on NIH <clears throat> to try to create a program for expanded access for patients in a in a trial that's going on now. NIH was very resistant, but they finally came to understand the importance of it and were willing to do it under certain conditions. We learned from NIH and we learned from FDA what we needed to do to support things that they already were willing to do, and then also to make sure they had the resources needed. Mm -hmm. The second thing that's very important to understand is that Congress has been very supportive of research. We've put multiple billions of dollars into NIH two years in a row. We're going to put new money into research for ALS. The Congressman Quigley and Fortenberry pushing hard to try to make progress with NIH. They came up with this new fund for 25 million for research, but research is very important, but there are patients right now <clears throat> who need treatment. And that means research may be 10 years away and that's not as hopeful as solving the problem of creating access to drugs that might be promising today. So and Ren, we have I'm gonna... to I'm going to jump in because we like to, this is, this is Ren and I's dynamic, everyone. You're welcome. You're getting a good taste of how we like to operate here. Um, piggybacking off of one another. I've seen some comments in the chat relative to the coalition that we're building from the outside advocates. I just want to state on the record that we continue to engage with the ALS Association and we're extremely hopeful that we can officially bring them on board. We understand what an important partner they are in this effort, and we have an ongoing dialogue uh, um, with, their, with, with them right now. Um, and and I'd want, I want people to um, know that because it was addressed specifically in the questions. But I think the more important piece is, to Ren's broader point, we, have a, we, have a we, we want to increase investment in research. And as Congressman Fortenberry 
laid out very well. We have had great success in appropriations comparatively. We want to continue that momentum forward. We want to put more money in. We do not want to lose sight of the fact that two things can happen at once. This bill has a narrowly tailored focus, quite intentionally. To throw in approximately 400 million additional dollars is going to do nothing but slow it down. We already face a challenging calendar and a lot of uh, um, uh, many obstacles to getting this to the House floor. A $450 billion price tag, million, excuse me, is not going to help. We want to prioritize all of these things, but in this particular instance, as it relates to 7071, this is a bill about expanded access because this is a bill about patients and treatment, and we have to find a way forward so that people who have ALS can not only have hope, but can have a longer life and can find a cure. Um, so those things are um, not mutually exclusive, and we want to continue engaging with the broader community so that we can get to a place where everyone understands that. I'll just say amen to, amen to that. Well, well said, Michelle. Thank you. I'm going to have to leave the call. I know there's perhaps other things that you all might want to talk to that do require uh, the, the depth of uh, expertise of both Allison and Wren. Um, but a couple of you have written on your chats, uh, on this chat box as I've scrolled through them, just thank you for the bipartisanship and the leadership. It's so refreshing. Somebody said, uh, I wish all America could see this. I think our country is longing. There's it, so many things exhausting us and our country is longing, uh, again, for uh, imagination and possibility. And so again, in this particular space, we're proud to, to, to be with you in solidarity and we're, we're just gonna work hard, okay? And, and help us, please help us. Um, we, we, we're, we, we just all need to be in, in, in part, beyond partnership, solidarity to, to get this done quickly. So thank you all so much. Thank you. Thank you for joining us so much. And, and Allison and, and Ren, if you are uh, still going to jump on, we can maybe go through a few other questions. If you have to jump off, we'll respect your time as well. So you let us know how much time you have to, to, to talk about a few other issues. Well, I want to only be respectful of your time because I know you have an additional part of the program, but if this is beneficial, I'm happy to stay and I'm sure Ren is as well. I think that I think everybody on the call would, would love to have some of the questions um, that we that we talked about earlier um, answered. So if you're good with that, we let's let's wrap you all with that. Uh, I'll do my I'll do my best. Okay. And Indy, I'm gonna oh there you go. Have you mute yourself? Okay. So let me pull up the uh, the questions that we had. So you know, one of the um, one of the things that a lot of pals have talked about. What you know, we talked about our scheduling. We went over that with the Congress people. When we ask about the ALS caucus and the Senate caucuses. It would be really helpful if, when there are House meetings, so many pals can't come speak to you, right? They can't attend the hearings. So, can we arrange for access so people can participate via Zoom that we can listen in, just like we do to Supreme Court hearings now, uh, oral arguments now, so that so that we have a voice and that people can have a way to participate? Is that something you can look into for them? Absolutely, and I think that you know. COVID certainly has opened all of our eyes to a new way of doing things. And I think that uh, Congress, uh, as a immovable beast at times, for better or worse, steeped in their traditions, don't, doesn't typically innovate at the same pace as perhaps other parts of the world. Again, I said that for better or worse, there are times where that serves a purpose. But um, ultimately, I think that all of our staffs and members too, have been exposed to a new way of communicating with their constituents. So I would welcome novel approaches that include technology. And, you know, on the other side of the coin, not to get on a soapbox, but here we are, we're fighting for a rare disease community, right? We want to be an accessible, non-ableist Congress. We want to be able to serve all of our constituents. We do not want to be putting barriers on people who have different needs. Um, I think that that should be the founding, founding principle with which we engage in those conversations, right? We have to meet people where they are. And uh, that's our responsibility as your elected leaders, certainly not your responsibility for people who may not have the same abilities to get up onto the hill. Um, it's I, if you had the opportunity, we can make it, we absolutely make it work. We have advocates from all, every stripe up on Capitol Hill. I'm sure many people on this call have been there time and time again. We welcome you. Um, but yes, I think we can absolutely facilitate new and uh, more modern ways of communicating. 
Perfect. That would be wonderful. And, you know, Ren, when you and I spoke, we talked about uh, telehealth and telemedicine. And so I know a lot of people on the call have spoken about um, being in rural communities, being a day's drive away from one of the ALS centers of excellence, um, not being able to access uh, clinicians like Dr. Merrick Kukovic, who is on our call uh, tonight and spoke a few weeks ago. Um, we have people whose neurologists just aren't able to identify whether they have ALS, taken two years to get diagnosed, where we know that if they had somebody like Jeff Rothstein um, or Merritt uh, looking at them, that that diagnosis would come sooner. And, and hopefully some of the therapies to help them. So can you talk a little bit about what's going on in the telehealth side of this? And if you don't have the answers now, if maybe that's something you can get us to ensure that, you know, it's, it's tough, right? For somebody with ALS who's in a wheelchair to get back and forth all the time to different clinicians, to drive across state lines, to take a 10 or 12 hour trip. So what can we do to provide more access for them to see the ALS Center of Excellence uh, criteria, right, you know, with, with the clinicians like Merritt and Jeff. Oh, are you muted? Did you mute yourself? No, Allison's not muted. Ren, are you there? You're unmuted, Allison. You should be able to speak. Sure. I think that Ren actually may have mentioned in the chat that he was um, had to go, but it does appear that he is muted, just for the record. Obviously, um, I think you got it, Ren? Yeah, so just, I, I actually need to go here very shortly. I think I think this is a big question. Look, COVID has given us a chance to deal with um, telehealth. We're certainly seeing a lot of the healthcare providers in Nebraska start to build out more of the functionality of that. I think the question will be, how do we deal with the reimbursement in, a, in an ongoing way to make sure that there's not, let's just say, fraud in the context of this? And this is going to be a real important conversation, but I think telehealth is here to stay. It's a very important part of, of, of things going forward. And, and frankly, I think we need to work on that potentially together. I just want to go back and, and close a couple of points that Allison raised, which I think is extremely important. And that is that there is a way to do this expanded access in which we know that some questions have been raised about whether clinical trial recruitment would be harmed. And I talked to Jensi Andrews, who was very supportive of the idea that we can do this very easily because once a trial is completely enrolled or if somebody falls out of the, the criteria for inclusion in a trial, they shouldn't be completely denied a treatment. And this is a, through the expanded access mechanism, we can expand the inclusion criteria so patients who may otherwise not be able to get into a trial can actually then get benefit from a drug. The other thing that someone raised on this uh, chat was very important is that we need to be able to realize that even with expanded access, there's a way to understand things like, can we learn more about biomarkers? Can we continue to do some research in the context of treating more patients with more drugs? And can we also do this by then also accelerating the dynamic in which we decide that a drug is futile? Because we've done, done a lot of trials, many of all of them almost have all failed. We, we treat people for very long periods of time. We need to decide whether something's working and keep moving on. So these are all very important um, dynamics around expanded access. So, and then, and as one person just said, companies will not pay for expanded access. This is a problem most can't afford. And that's exactly why we are doing this because a lot of the, the new molecules are coming from small companies. They don't have a lot of capital. They may have something very useful. <clears throat> and if they don't have any way to cover the cost of expanded access, we need to make sure there is a means to do that. We also need to, I, I'm very frustrated by FDA and the discussions around open label extension. And we need to understand where that ends up. I'm very proud of, of Merit and what she's doing uh, on the platform trials, working with patients to make sure that they work through this dynamic with new companies that FDA is not holding accountable. Each one of these pieces, open label extension, expanded access, uh, uh, a more rapid uh, uh, 
trial design and discovery through FDA. All of these are part of getting more resources into ALS and also accelerating the possibility of making it a chronic disease until we find a cure. I think open label extensions has been a really big um, problem, right, for people in the ALS community. So one of the things is to maybe to take back to the other congressmen is how can we encourage open label extensions? Is that giving more, um, maybe another year of patent protection? Maybe it's giving uh, tax relief to the companies that offer it, but incentivizing drug manufacturers to have a reason to do open label extensions for people, right? Well, Allison and I have had some very significant conversations around this. Both of us support the intention of open label extension. I think we need to understand again, where is FDA going to go in terms of their guidance? We were very disappointed that their guidance didn't lead to um, dynamics around other companies, new companies having to provide open label extension. Mm -hmm. But we're trying to, I, I think there is an important dialogue that needs to be built and we can work with the clinical community and with the patient community. And frankly, we would be open to introducing a new bill around this. Um, but we also don't want to fight battles that can't be fought. And if we then do introduce a new bill, we need to make sure we create alignment with the regulatory um, uh, agencies and also with the, the research agencies and the funding and the corporations. And I think it's important to take this on as an issue, but I don't think it's completely mature yet. And, and that's, that's why I really congratulate Merritt on the work she's doing because she is trying to frame that in a very constructive way and we need to make sure that continues. Yeah, and so actually Merritt actually said on the call that she would really appreciate, um, as most of the clinicians we've talked to, having um, more telehealth reimbursement if people are gonna be going across state, state lines. And I don't know if Ren and if, if, uh, you and Allison saw that, but wanted to make sure we spoke that into uh, well, we can certainly talk about that. That's a big problem because I, I, looking, ha having been a state health commissioner and worked with our Texas insurance commissioner, the problem is, is that when you do things across state lines, insurance commissioners get very nervous about that. So this is not simple. And uh, obviously there are some states that don't have experts in, in, in ALS like you have at Mass General and at Harvard like Merritt and and Bob Brown at, at, at Mass General. So this is a problem, but, but it gets to state law and it's hard for federal government to push that. But it's certainly, mm -hmm. if we could carve that out specifically, we could, if we could carve that out around certain diseases, that would be easier like ALS, which is a rarer disease in which there are fewer clinical trial sites. So there could be some potential around that if we, if we didn't try to make it primary care. And that's exactly what I was going to add, Ren, because what I wanted to say was, you know, your comments on COVID relative to telehealth are very important because as we know, the history on telehealth has a, is, is a rural history, right? From a policy perspective, our expansion of telehealth has, through CMS and through Medicare, has primarily been a result of geographic d diversity. My boss represents the north side of Chicago. We have come to understand that telehealth, while certainly has incredible needs in the rural community, unique needs, the kinds that Brent and his boss represent, they also have incredible needs in the city of Chicago and places like it. So reimagining the concept, you know, 20, 25 years later and, and utilizing technology that's such an incremental part of our broader healthcare delivery system is a major focus. And I think that I will totally echo Ren's thoughts that we, we will never go back. We're not going back post COVID to a world without telehealth. Um, I don't wanna battle on if we wanna have more questions. I have more to add, but I'm happy to pause. <laughs> I, I apologize, but I actually have to go now, but I, I, I'm, I'm really grateful for every one of you. I know some of you, I see people that I know, I, I have, I feel like I'm fighting on your behalf. I feel like this is a, I didn't ask to be involved in ALS. ALS asked me to be involved in it and I, I can't stop. So I just um, am grateful for every one of you. I'm sorry for the journeys you each take. I watched Joe Gregory over a year and I, I, I wept that I couldn't help him. So 
Um, I, I, I just, every time we can talk, but we need to be a team and we need to, we need to win this battle a step at a time. Correct. We're not going to chew the elephant all together. We're going to get this elephant done a step at a time. Now in our first battle, so Ren, thank you both for taking the several hours that you spent on the phone with me the first time we talked and for uh, helping us get this set up because you were, you were the first person that said yes. Um, and, and got Congressman Fortenberry uh, on this call. So a lot of gratitude for the time you spent with me, but for also the advocacy you did so that all of the people on this call had access to Congressman uh, Fortenberry and Congressman Quigley. So thank you for joining us and, and for taking a lot longer than you that thought you were gonna have on tonight. I'm very grateful for that. All right, take care everybody. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Allison, if we could just ask, I know you uh, want to respect your time, so if you have to jump off, uh, you know, just tell us. But I do have a couple of other questions that have come up over and over again. Sure. Um, if you're if you're okay, then we'll keep rolling, and and then we'll jump on to the other part of the call uh, in just a second. So a lot of people have um, have asked about why does COVID get expedited? Why did they have prioritization? What what makes COVID different than a you know, when we message this to, to our congressmen that we're talking to, COVID has a 1% case fatality rate or 2%, whatever our data is going to end up being. Whereas we know that ALS is like a 99.9% .9 case fatality rate, right? And so we know that there's different bills, but can you explain to people what why COVID gets ex expedited, why there's a prioritization for COVID and there's not for ALS, and how can we fix that? Sure. Um, obviously, um, I don't want this answer to be um, incomplete. The novel nature of COVID and the difference, I want to rewind. Congress was faced with an unprecedented situation in dealing with COVID. That's not to suggest that other diseases are not unprecedented. The difference really relates to epidemiology. And when you're facing a global pandemic, as we have all seen, the repercussions are far reaching. Um, I think that the majority of the COVID spending that Congress has taken on this year is designed to shore up many parts of this global pandemic. The difference, of course, I mean, they were massive bills. There's no doubt about that. There's no, there's no debate about that. The difference is that they are also not necessarily going to be sustained because the vast majority of quote unquote COVID work probably had little to do, not exclusively, but less to do with the actual health component of the disease. So clearly we have to expedite our understanding of COVID we have to get our grasp on a global pandemic. But the basic science on SARS-like flus already exists. There, are, there is a basic science at NIH, obviously, you know, we're fortunate to have Dr. Fauci, everybody, you know, household name, leading that effort. Um, so the, the constraints and the uh, objectives are, quite frankly, just different. We are not going to be sustaining trillions of dollars in COVID spending. This is really to be understood as a global emergency. Um, so it places unique constraints on Congress this session. There's no doubt about that. But I think that in what we can do as a community or what I would recommend to do is, as we kind of alluded to all night, there is a before COVID and after COVID in the health policy world. Um, the world has changed before our eyes in the past four or five months. We have to reap those lessons and apply them to the needs and goals that we have in this community and across, you know, dealing with all sorts of other societal ills, but for this conversation in the health policy space. I think that there are structures of government that will be permanently altered and most for the better. And so I can't answer that question entirely beyond what may seem obvious relative to the global emergency. But what I can say is that there are clear lessons about, and we just talked about it with telehealth, that's one very small example, but there are other lessons that will be reaped and that we should utilize because it's a powerful tool
tool to have when you come to Congress to say, this is a model that you already took up. Hey, by the way, you voted for it. Uh, members of Congress are quite tuned into what they vote for, right? That's their public record. Um, there are, there's ways to leverage that information, and I would encourage that to happen. Well, and, and so the legislation, um, the bill or the legislation, the law that relates to COVID is actually a separate part of the statute of the regulatory scheme. So it doesn't apply to COVID and to ALS, but I love your suggestion mm -hmm. that if we do it for, if we do it for COVID, we can do it for ALS. And I think, you know, we have a member of our team who is an epidemiologist with her PhD and works at one of the largest cancer research companies. And she talked to us about cancer drugs and how you know, they get expedited. There is um, in the Orphan Drug Act, right. uh, there's, a, there's a regulation for pediatric cancer drugs. It's called a, I think it's called a prioritization voucher, if I'm using the right terminology. And so that's one of the other things we can talk about. What do we need to do down the road to get a prioritization voucher so that these drugs get looked at more quickly so that we don't have a 10 year or 12 year wait, right? Totally agree. And again, not to beat a dead horse here, but Ren and I are totally tuned into suggestions around the Orphan Drug Act and how we can better utilize them for a disease like ALS. Um, it's, it's an ongoing conversation. I don't have anything to announce on that, but it's part of our conversations about potential edits to our bill. And if it's not in our bill, if we are able to you know, address those in this particular piece of legislation, uh, we, we sort of have formed this coalition through the caucus and particularly through our boss's leadership that we're open to any and all future ALS bills. We've, we've developed a great partnership and uh, we have a lot of ideas on the table. So I will take that under consideration and just assure you that it's not off of our radar. Perfect. And, you know, I know we unmuted Merritt and Merritt, you know, you have such a powerful voice in this. So if you've got any comments to add to the dialogue um, we had going here as well. Oh, th uh, thank you. Um, we covered like so many topics. I, I, um, I just want to uh, uh, give a huge shout out for, you know, really for thanking um, every all the speakers for um, the support for the EAP program. Um, I, I kind of made a comment before that I, I tell patients that the right to try law is actually a good thing because it convinced companies who never wanted to do EAP before that they preferred to do EAP than right to try. Mm -hmm. We've gotten a lot more companies agreeing to it than, than before that law because they, they'd rather have some oversight of it than no oversight. So I think that actually pushed it in the right direction. And then now having the ability, hopefully, to be able to fund it will, will get us all the way there because that does still seem to be the biggest uh, barrier. So the difference with extended access for some of the people that don't know versus right to try is right to try was just the patient and the doctor, whereas ex um, extended access is, is the patient, the doctor, and the FDA, correct? Yes, exactly. Yes. It's a fast, you know, we've done some of the EAPs. It's actually a fast review at the FDA. It can be, you know, a week. A week was the fastest I've, saw, I've seen, but it can be two weeks. And same for the IRB. But it does, you know, you just, you do need to fund it. And a lot of companies do tell us that they'd love to do it, but they didn't plan for it in their uh, fundraising. So they only have enough drug for the, the double blind and the open label. So they need the funds. And then it doesn't cost a lot at the sites, but it costs a little bit. And then like you mentioned, it's patients to be able to go get to the site. So it, it's, you know, I, I think this bill would be just transformational. So and, and Mary, since you're on the call, when we talk about expanded access and we look at a population of patients that only maybe it's 80% of the patients that don't qualify, from a clinician's perspective and a researcher's perspective, having the ability to have a patient who normally wouldn't qualify for the trial, but that data is still going to be available to you as a clinician, what does that mean to you for your ability to talk about what, how that drug is going to be used in the future and, and how does that contribute having that much bigger data set? I think it can be really huge. Um, you know, for example, the, the, the recent drug approval of Daravone was done in a very limited population in the trial, like 7% of people were eligible for that trial in Japan. And we were left with not knowing, does it work in everybody? And an expanded access will allow you to, um, you know, if you designed it well, to get some of those answers that would help um, physicians and patients know whether it's, it's worth taking and insurance companies to know whether to pay for it. So I think you can broaden the pool. Uh, and you can also build in, as other people have said, biomarkers or other things to learn. But most importantly, it's a good thing to do. You know, I'll just say like today, I got an email from someone who said, you know, I wanted to be in the platform trial, but because of COVID, you didn't start in April and now I'm not eligible. And how awesome it would be to be able to say, okay, but we have the expanded access for you then. 
you know, because it's, it's, it's awful to say, well, it, it's just, there's no good answer other than there's another option that's good to, get, to yeah. provide. No you. humanity being able to say that, right? No humanity yeah. in that answer, but it's, so it's, it's what's limited by the FDA and the trial design that's submitted. And that's what expanded access is going to do. It's going to change the, change the, our ability to get you guys into trials um, through the expanded access process. So, um, you know, one of the other questions that came up and it's, it's, um, it came up with several different people that messaged Allison and it's with the legislation um, for people. And I think I'm going to, I'm going to massacre the name. I want to say, is it the, uh, the J Jimmy, Jim, J, J I M M E. It was a settlement agreement um, with Catherine Sebelius back when she was a Jimmo agreement. Um, and it basically, there's a lot of people that are getting physical therapy or have home health care and the insurance companies are denying them coverage for that. So instead of being able to have 30 hours of home health services, they're only getting two or three a week. Or instead of being able to get physical therapy that's helping keep their muscles strong and keeping them functional, it's limited to a couple hours a week or it, it completely eliminated because they aren't improving. And the standard was, it's not supposed to be an improving standard, the settlement agreement. So what do PALS do? Who do they reach out to if that settlement agreement isn't being enforced properly by uh, the insurance company that they're working with? Sure. So obviously that would ultimately come down. And I think that, man, I wish Ren was on the call as a former administrator because he had has sort of had a front row seat to this in his own role. Clearly from my perspective, I think that there's a, that, you know, I, you can certainly reach out to your member of Congress because there's a casework element, but really that comes at a much higher level, right? There's both the human element from a patient perspective in which we can potentially try to engage, but you're with insurers that really comes from a much heavier hand, which is a regulatory conversation. Um, there are, I'm happy to follow up with like more detailed resources for that, because as I said, I think that Ren would have a, a, a more, robust answer to that question. But I think that the important thing is that this kind of goes back to the theme that we were talking about earlier, Michelle, which is about beyond access. I think that that has become a bit of a buzzword and means different things depending on who says it and what it really means. I think that there's clearly a conversation currently happening around health equity and we discussed that in a different context with the environmental piece, but I think that that also relates to when you fight with your insurance company, right? That's part of the reason that Congress engages on those fights. It's just simply unconscionable for an insurer to be able to deny that. Part of the reason why the Obama administration brought the lawsuit. So it's on the books. Um, not everybody has access to a lawyer to fight an insurance company. So that's why you need your public representatives to do that from a, from a bigger picture, right? Your individual member of Congress might be able to engage for you on a casework situation, but you have to draw that out to understand the people who are most impacted um, and, and vulnerable in our society clearly have a direct connection to um, these diseases. And even it, nobody should be asked to do that, regardless of what your situation is, right? I think that there's just... Um, I think that's really part of the power with the ALS community with such a despicable disease. Um, and, and like everyone, I mean, I've lost, I lost an aunt to ALS. I lost my favorite teacher in high school who was an incredible man. You know, I've seen uh, certainly not a, as up close and personal as some other people on the call, but I like all of us have a personal connection to this. And I think that in diseases like this, there has to be that narrow focus on the legislation. I think that that is a powerful tool because oftentimes people in the health policy world resist doing things because they don't want to go down a slippery slope. Um, our narrowly tailored focus on the very unique contours of ALS, I think are actually a huge benefit uh, because it can carve out essentially some special treatment. And I think that that's well-deserved until we get to a place where we have parity in our treatments and cures. So on the insurance question, um, I'd love Ron to follow up about that if there's other sort of agencies to pursue, but I think that broadening that out, um, it's against the law. So we have to find ways to uh, pursue that from a public perspective when insurers essentially break the law. I muted myself. Sorry about that. In the comments, uh, Eileen added that sometimes it's not even the insurance carriers, it's the home health agencies that are creating the problem. Sure. So we will, um, 
a lot of middlemen, a lot of middlemen in the healthcare delivery system, right? I mean, there's a lot of players. Absolutely. So you guys, just so you know, there, we have so many questions that have come in both in the chat as well as previously. So we will get back together with Ren and Allison and we'll get some of the answers um, if, we, if we don't have time, because I do want to be respectful of everybody's time as well tonight, um, because yeah. they were supposed to spend 20 to 30 minutes with us and we are now coming up on, on 90 minutes. So And I don't want to be respect I don't want to be disrespectful of your time either, because I know you have a debrief. So I'm happy to hop off if you want to transition and you can follow up with us at any point in time. It really, I know it's been said before, but it was an incredible honor to speak to such a big audience. We are ultra committed to this fight. Um, I hope that our passion was communicated. I'm so glad that our bosses allowed us the opportunity to speak on their behalf. Um, you know, Congressman Fortenberry said, you want to talk to the member. I respectfully disagree. You want to talk to the staff because they really get the stuff done. But um, so thanks everybody for your time. And please, as I said before, uh, utilize this as a resource, consider us friends and we will be in touch soon. Thank you so much, Allison. Really blessed to have you on and, and incredibly grateful for, for all of you to Ren, Congressman Fortenberry, you as well as Congressman Quigley. And you will hear a lot of us screaming on social media to support you and, and we'll be in touch to talk to your communications team about messaging. So thank you so much for that. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye, everyone. Okay, everyone.